once you get out of your car in the parking lot and cross that threshold at the beginning of the dock, you feel a, a calmness and a less noise, almost almost no noise, and you start seeing. Most of these houses are occupied by artistic types or people who have uh, artistic inclinations. And so you start seeing how their projects are going and then you walk into your house and you've got this, your own little magic wonderland of your own. Well, it was a cabin on the on the beach. This area around here was, was a lot of mills and uh, whatever. So I probably didn't have to come very far to be moved onto the onto the water. And it went it went across from the University of Washington to one of those houseboats over there. This this lived over there for, for many years. And then about 1960, it was moved here. And then this guy that owned all these, most of these docks, like 70% of these, all of the, of the houseboat docks was owned by one guy. And he was kind of like the evil, the evil empire. But we 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 formed this demi corporation in California and tended like we were developers from California who wanted to buy it. He would he wouldn't talk to groups of residents other than the, other. So we had to kind of fool him. I'm not sure whether he was completely fooled or not. But anyway, he ended up making a deal with this company in California, which was not a company in California. And uh, Docks Corporation was was formed. So that's 31 houses on these two docks, and uh, he built the monster on the end of the uh, end of our dock which tees off the center and you if you get into this, a lot of houseboats if you, you you realize that that's our my front door with the my front French doors I could I could in the old days look out and see boats go by so by putting that putting that T uh, put a, building a T on the on the end what she could do because he owned the place was kind of unfortunate. This houseboat is not very well heated. As you can see, the bottom part of those French doors right there, you can see light through there. And that's, I mean, all over this house, there's places where that where it leaks in like that. So if it's super cold, if it, if it gets below 28 or so for Seattle, that's super cold. Uh, just, it's, un, it's it's a project that you never really get done. It's you know, space heaters, right? And space heaters and floor heaters working 24 hours a day, and they, they're not, they're not, can't keep up. It was built in 1914. We had it surveyed when we bought it. Supposedly it has good bones, but it's, you know, it's like I say, it's, there's nothing, no, no insulation between the walls and the outside. And it's, you know, it's not a deluxe build, building even for the time period that it was built. But we, we, I loved it. We loved it. It was owned by a, an Alaska Airlines stewardess before that. The, she, the stewardess, had done a lot of the thing, like the work that's done in the bathroom in the kitchen, all that kind of, that, all that kind of rough stuff that was down there with all these those shelves exposed. And everything that was something that the that the uh, stewardess had had built. It's, there used to be a fire pit right where that rug is there. Chimney that went up right went into the ceiling right above that uh, where that rug is. And we had some women come out, chimney, chimney sweeps. They had a company here that was a, a couple of women that do that. And we hired them to come out and do this sweep our, our smokestacks. And the woman, the woman who did it says, you got to get rid of this thing. This thing is just a, this is a, a death trap. This, this will not, you will not live long in this house. The way this fire, this way this thing is fixed up. And just, I mean, just to imagine how this is so woody and, uh, and then this an unkept fire through a, goes fast, it goes six feet through an inner wall of tinder dry wood is, uh, you know, asking for it. So anyway, we got rid of that. And then, but we had, uh, there, there were times that we, we, we bought, had firewood packed, piled up here uh, instead of planter boxes. And uh, I think it was only only about two winters uh, that I was here that we had the fireplace going, then it was, went away. And this house was like one of the last uh, around here of this old fashioned one story cabin, basically, ever built off of the logs. There was a house right here next to me here, which had an old guy named George in it. And he, uh, it, it was, it was, the house was about as big as from that set of windows to, to you. And then the rest of the whole thing was a wide open deck with he and his little dog. Well, this was actually was bought by by Lady Zilla in about 1975 or so, 70-76. She had come from Idaho, and she loved the houseboat scene, and she decided when she moved here that she was going to get a houseboat. So she searched around, and then this, this was, became available. It was $24,000. Big money bingo, man. She bought it, and she had to take a big loan out. 
we paid for it over over a lot of years, and finally it became ours. But it was it was a it was a pretty big deal. But during that period of time, during while the mortgage was getting paid off, these things basically went from a I would say in the fifties it was kind of a bohemian the bohemians a lot of artists a lot of bohemians uh, lifestyle came out of here poets and, and then in the sixties it became still artists and and uh, people that were not so bound up in traditional working patterns that was the that was that was the scene it was there was a houseboat scene zella owned this place for three years i think before i moved in she was a head teacher at an alternative school in seattle and i was teaching at that school and we ended up getting together and uh, i moved moved in with her and we basically set up a she she bought the place and this this was her place, really. We we developed over the years a relationship very much like a husband and wife. Uh, and in the year 2000 and 2009, we signed up for a, something called a second. The Secretary of State had a thing for domestic partners, where you could get a license or you get a certificate from the from the Washington State that you were of, of official partners, which was something we did kind of as, a, as on a lark. It's kind of like when I stayed in Mexico and I realized after lying in this crummy house for three weeks and doing nothing except for reading books and listening to the music, that was it. That was the answer. It was the, listening to the music and reading books. And it wasn't, I mean, I could just go in and flop down on the bed and go to sleep at night, but that was the secret of the place. Was I was just completely relaxed and completely living in the hammock world. And I think the, the moment that I had is after living here for a few years, and Zell and I's relationship kind of leveled out to was we agreed on things almost completely, all kinds of. We both went, went to the movies every week, and we did all kinds of stuff together. Just the quietness and the neighborhood and the neighbors. And after a few years, you realize this is different than most of the city, and it's wonderful. And it's not something that you automatically get or you feel is something that takes some time to kind of work through your thick skull. We both loved Mexican food, and we, we went one New Year's Eve, so Zell and I went to Mexico City, which was a very strange place to go on, on New Year's Eve. The whole town, the whole city of Mexico City goes to Zivadeo or Cancun or something on the, over the holidays, so it was very, very not busy. But uh, a few years later than that, my friend in American Music, where I was working at by then, uh, told me about a friend of his who had found a place called Zihuatanejo, and we made reservations for a place there, and ended up spending a couple of weeks at a place, a place there. And then, when I was about, we were about ready to finish our vacation. Zella basically said, why don't you stay down here and have two or three months by yourself? Well, I don't know if I deserve this sympathy, but I had just come through a lot of bringing up children and taking care of schedules and teaching school and coordinating with an ex-wife that I did not get along very well with. So it was such a wonderful thing to have those that time alone. That that became our pattern of living for about five years after that. So we would come down for Christmas, and then then I would stay down for a couple of months by by myself, and then go back home again. It was during that when I was in Mexico, I was uh, first living on this this Casa La Playa, which is there, fourteen dollars a night, a real crummy place, but it was on the beach in downtown Zihuatanejo. And after about two weeks, I, when I first saw this apartment, I thought or this house for rent, I thought this is a real shithole, and it was. I mean, it was just bare cement walls and exposed plumbing and open rickety rackety fan. And but after about two weeks of being in the hammock and reading books and listening to music and not thinking about much of else, I realized that I was in heaven. I was in the perfect place. I've always considered myself kind of a, not an artist, but an art, an art consumer. I'm happy to be in that role. My best friends in Mexico was a Mexican woman, Natalia, and her, her Norwegian boyfriend, Stein. And we they lived in a building which had been a hotel, a bodega, and a hotel in downtown Zivadeo, right on the water. The mother had brought the family up in that house. Stein and Natalia had two shops, one a shop of clothing and indigenous art, and the other, La Zapoteca, a, a store completely of rugs from of Oaxaca, made by the Zapotec Indians. I just liked the rugs, and I liked some of the stuff in the store. 
place isn't big enough to hold a collection of everything. These alabrijes animals, uh, I love them. There's so many of them available in the world, and I tried to buy ones that were iconic or good examples of the best of the best. So there's people who, who know those animals would, would say that's really a good collection of them. Rugs, I also have a really nice collection of the Zapotec Indian rugs. That's a very nice collection of alebrijes. The blue and black cat was done by Senor Jimenez, the original guy to do that, from a town called Xoxo on the outskirts of Oaxaca. The whole town carves these animals now, and uh, I think I have a very, very good collection of them now. My Lady Zella was a graduate student in Pocatello, and she was friends with a lot of people in the art department. She kept the artist friendships for the rest of her life. She and I had very similar tastes in art, and it was one of our joys of being together. I used to drive around Lake Pátzcuaro on Sundays, and one day I came into this village called San Francisco Uricho, and they were having a traditional ceremony. These boys dressed up like conquistadors and women, and they would go from house to house. Some of the people in the group would go into the house and bless the house's Madonna, and there was a band that was playing with them, and it was really a joyful ceremony that I was lucky to be the only gringo photographer there. My father went to Japan before World War II, and then in the 60s became president of the Japan American Society. He was given this uh, kabuki in a box. So this Japanese scribe has been in our family for a long time. It was given to us by a Japanese family in Hawaii, and it's something that's been in display in my house since the 60s. I love his details, and his overall attitude is just beautiful to me. In a house built, you have no extra space. If you look around our house, there's not many walls that aren't covered with pictures. It's almost too much, but there's no, there is no extra space in a houseboat. So you learn to put either get rid of something to add something new, or you know you just you just have to find a place for it. That picture of the steel hulled sailing vessels that used to go ply the Pacific coast with logs and oysters. I remember those ships anchored out in Lake Union. It's a great painting I hung in my dad's office for 20 years or 30 years. And uh, I, I think it really catches the mood from around here a long time ago. Our crumbs cut it from my generation of artists and cartoonists in the 60s, and I love his sensibility and his work. That poster in the kitchen is a sequential story of what mankind is doing to the earth. William Cummings, I became a friend with Hazel Wolf. I was at her apartment once where she gave me uh, this picture, this little drawing by William Cummings. She said she thought it had been painted at the Blue Moon. My friend Dan owns the Georgia Strait in Vancouver, and he got a promotion package from the studios of Cartier-Bresson of a show that was coming. And there were two of these photographs. Mine, he gave me this one of this, these two transvestites in Guatemala, and I've loved it for years. It's just a great photo. Sharon Beals is an acquaintance from the 60s. She's now in the Bay Area, takes wonderful photos of birds' nests. She has a couple of books or a book on them, I think. And she's very involved in the environmental action of, of the Bay Area. I saw this picture that Jeff Bahalo did at the Collins Inn Pub, which is owned by my son. I called him up and made a deal to buy it. He brought it over here, and he looks like a great guy. Frank Samuelson is my fave artist around here. He uses iconic things like rhododendrons and salmon and rivers and waves and evergreen trees, wonderful colors, always a kind of a sense of humor to his pictures. He's a great guy. I have three of his paintings in here, which is a lot. Well, I bought some really nice art in Tokyo in the late 60s, and other times I've bought stuff which I've used or then rotated out. Lynn Voltaire was a buddy of mine from the Blue Moon days, Red Robin days. I went to this show of his in Ballard. It was working man's themed, and all the pictures were done in a blueprint method. And I bought the picture of the blueprint of the bandana. And I've loved that picture for years, and he was a really great guy. I guess you would call me one of the old guard, although I, I'm kind of I'm an exceptionalist. Structure itself has not really changed at all, but I'm completely surrounded by houses that are two stories up now, and all but one of them was, was only one story when I first moved in here 40 years ago. Though I basically I watched the whole dock go up, and that's because the value of the property has become so outrageously high, so amazing amount of value added. And that's because it went from move for those working people and those who used to live here became lawyers and architects and college professors. This banana ski, these were popular in the late 50s, early 60s. Between 58 and 60, I water skied almost daily with my friends. 
Well, people who own houseboats, especially on Lake Union, are very popular on the 4th of July. One of the early years of the Fat Tuesday, and Michelli had a sausage sandwich place down there, and he gave me, he, I worked there for the day, frying up Italian sausages for his sandwiches, dipping into the wine the whole day. So by the time the day was over, I was pretty well plastered and came home. There was all these people in, in here, party members, half of them zealous friends from school and half of them my friends, and I remember it was a very really wonderful day of talking about possibilities of the school system and general life philosophy stuff but when I came home I wanted to get this layer of grease off my body I felt like I was had been dipped in pig grease so I walked through the house and I just started peeling off my clothes and by the time I got to there I pulled off my shorts and I dove into the lake and it was like it was like a science fiction movie. I felt like when I dove in, the water was cool enough so that all that stuff broke off of me and I was freed and then I got out and uh, became the host of the party. <laughs> well, Zell and I used to do this ourselves. We used to call it the two-hour gardening project because we would go out and buy all of the, everything that we needed, bring it back, set it on the dock, then go through, pull everything out, put some new fresh dirt on the top of stuff and replant everything and have the whole thing done in a couple of hours. That was, and then we would if the weather was right and the, if it was planted at the right time, in a couple of weeks, that, that box right there is my favorite. It fills up with salmon and purple impatience. Then there's a strawberry pot here that's got a place for about 15 lobelia. We plant 15 lobelia, and that place ends up just being totally overgrown and flowing down all of the same color of purple flowers. And then I just ordered a, we have, there's a garden store out by Issaquah or somewhere like that, that we would buy flowers from them for years, four or five of these baskets of flowers. My my gardening person could do, do these too. It's just they really do a good job with them out there. I ordered one of those the other day, so we're going to get one of those probably in the first week of May. And that's kind of like the cornerstone lead flower deal. And then, then we ought to put some flowers around the front door and on the deck right here. Hi, my name is Peter Howard. Welcome aboard my 110-year-old houseboat. Uh, we hope to, you've seen a little bit of the Lake Union history, my art collection from Northwest Artists, and my folk art collection from Mexico. We've had a great summer for flowers, and we hope you enjoyed seeing my stuff as much as I've enjoyed showing it to you. Thank you for coming. Hasta pronto.